Hi, this is Rachel McElroy. Hi, this is Griffin McElroy. And this is wonderful. Isn't it just? I think so. Isn't it just, though? Hey, can I say something? Uh Uh-huh. Didn't watch the Emmys last night. All right, so we could do a lot of stuff with that. About not watching it. Yeah, sure. Um, And not in like a, uh, like, we're so cool because we didn't watch the... Yeah, no, we just didn't. Um, but let's talk about some of our favorite Emmy memories from previous years where we did enjoy the program. Ooh, I'm not going to remember any. Emmys, as we all know, short for Emma Lines, who made the first TV show, which Ooh. was mm-hmm. Alf. Oh, my gosh. So, um, hitting me where I live. Yeah. Emmeline knew it had your number. Let's um, go back and forth naming Alf characters. Okay. I'll start. Alf. Willie. The cat. What was the cat's name, Griffin? Garfield. Oh, geez. All right, I'll just give you Lucky. Lucky the cat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was Raquel Akmanik. Uh, Steven. <laughs> Is like Steven, but with a P in there because they Kate are. Kate was Willie's wife. Uh, Mel Mac. Nope. Was the planet? Yeah, it's not a character though. Gordon Shumway. That's Alf's real name. <laughs> Randy Shumway. <laughs> Ah, uh, you win, okay? You know more shit about Alf than I Gosh, do. I need to start an Alf podcast. What would the name of that be called? Ooh, buddy. Um, uh, maybe Help Me Rhonda. Why? Well, on Mel Mac. <laughs> <laughs> His girlfriend's name was Rhonda. Okay. Uh, and when he hears the song Help Me Rhonda, it takes him back. Okay. To the memories of Rhonda. Wow. Like sexual memories? Do they ever really get into Alf's sexuality? And he has like, this weird thing with Lynn for a while, which is the teenage daughter. Wait, what? <clears throat> well, they don't get together, but there's this tension. You did say there's this weird thing between yeah, them. Yeah, no, there's a tension. He is a weird... He becomes r- interested in her. Sure, but he is like a wrinkle-nosed little goblin monster. Oh my gosh, Griffin. And she... No, let's just call him how he sees him. And she is a human being um, woman... How did they think that was cool for the TV show? I guess Mork and Mindy, though, they, they, they like were, they were official, right? Yeah. And he was for sure an alien, but he didn't have a weird wrinkle nose. He was, he looked a lot like Robin Williams, the actor. Mm hmm. So, what's your small wonder this week? Small <laughs> Wonders is another TV show. Well, I think it's just, I think it's singular. Sure. I don't think there's multiple on that show. Do you have a small wonder this week? I do. Okay. Uh, I am reading a book. I am so <laughs> fucking proud of you this is the second book i have ever it's so exciting the first one was the third harry potter book Mm -hmm. now i uh since henry has been born i have not read many books i read john hodgman's vacation land that was excellent the only book i think i've read and then i read another one uh oh actually i'm currently reading i don't want to get ahead of myself you may not finish let's leave yourself yeah, some no, wiggle room true. to really Although fucking... i got it from the library so like i the pressure's on okay uh it's modern lovers by emma straub okay i'm not finished with it yet but i'm enjoying it is it good i think so okay i don't know i don't know much she about wrote books. the vacationers a few years back okay uh, which was like a real hip summer read all right um my small oh my god the new season of great british bake off or great oh, british baking show on netflix is so fucking good noel fielding is so good the other co-host whose name i can't remember is very very good it's all so good mm-hmm. and the challenges are a little bit more design oriented rather than like bake a good you know a nice loaf of bread it's like bake a loaf of bread that looks like a handbag like they do that sometimes in the old seasons mm-hmm. but this season is just like every challenge has like a wild design element yeah they're trying it. out a lot of new stuff it's very watchable and it, it was watchable before but now it seems a little more i don't i don't know a little more risque i guess yeah there's a lot of very suggestive humor there no is. joke um so that's good uh i tell you what's good the uh the movie from the 80s the thing um, I, I started, I went down like a YouTube rabbit hole of like practical special effects and I watched like a oh. video about the practical special effects of the thing. And man, I fucking love that movie. It is like, it is gory as hell and like campy as hell, but the, the special effects in that movie that they accomplish, I, I mean, do you, you remember the first time you saw it? It was not, I was maybe, I think I was in college. Okay. I feel like you you were you a big proponent of that. Yeah, movie. I think we watched it together, right? Yes. Everything like all the stuff that happens in that movie, that scene where like the guy turned every scene where 
guys turn into monsters is is all like puppetry and and practical effects uh and watching this video i was like i already was really impressed by it but seeing like just how ahead of its time it was and how like brilliant that show was like really 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 blew me away i'm a sucker for like really good practical effects in movies Mm -hmm. i also watched a thing about the lord of the rings movie specifically um like forced perspective and how they accomplished uh like the height differences between the hobbits and uh you know gandalf uh it's like really fucking fascinating because they had to do that shit the whole movie Mm -hmm. anyway um yeah practical effects in general i'm into um the fly also um but the thing is just a good flick i haven't seen the the not remake they made like a prequel in 2011 i haven't seen it but um i think you go first this week i do do you want to tell me what it is three words griffin a wolf friday night oh lights my. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, this is one's going to be a real touchdown. This segment. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, love that show. I have watched the whole series maybe three times, four times. I think four times, maybe. I think I've done just the two. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fair because we you watched it once. I watched it with you for the first time, but you had watched it before. Oh, there was a sort of cult of fandom around this show for all of my Austin friends that yes. you all sort of adopted me into when yeah, I moved down pretty here. Pretty much immediately when Griffin moved here, we were like, you have to you sit have down to and watch, watch the show. show. And I didn't really get it. Um, but like they shot a lot of stuff locally. And so I think yeah. that there, when you lived in Austin, like in that era, you had to be watching this fucking show um, because they, they shot stuff down at the, the Alamo freeze or whatever the actual establishment is. <laughs> Uh, so this was a five season show from 2008 to 2011. Really a four season show. They had a, it's weird. You know how some hotels skip the 13th um, floor? They just go one right into three and then four and five. Isn't that (laughs) weird how they did that? Uh, Season two is not very good. Yeah. I'm not here to talk about that. No. Uh, A bunch of very popular actors these days got their start. Or not their start necessarily, but, you know, <clears throat> gained notoriety oh, in the sure. show Friday Night Yeah, Cuba Gooding Jr., uh, Bobcat Goldthwait. Uh, Whoa, what is this show you're describing? <laughs> what an unusual pairing that is. Yeah, sure. Um, Vince Vaughn. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Rutger Hauer. I don't even know what that name is you just said. Cool. Uh, no, yeah, there are some big, some big names on this one. Uh, so Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan, indeed. <laughs> Jesse Plemons. Jesse Plemons is maybe the big, uh, sur- surprisingly, the biggest name know, to come out of I the know. TV show. Uh, Minka Kelly. Sure. Um, gosh, and there's any number. I mean, Kyle Chandler and Connie Burton were already pretty established actors, but definitely got them a lot of attention. Yeah, I've seen the kid who played... Um, Oh my God! I guess we have to watch it again because I can't remember <laughs> this is the backup quarterback's name. Uh, Saracen. Saracen. Uh, I've seen him in a, in a few in a few flicks. Matt Loria. Yeah, I think that might be his name. And of course, uh, Riggins. Uh, was, oh, he was in, Taylor Kitsch. Taylor Kitsch had a sort of everyone sort of thought he was going to be the biggest he was thing to come meteoric, out of the show. And then we haven't seen him lately. Oh, yeah, like a meteor, he crashed into Earth, or should I say Mars, or should I say John Carter's Welcome to Mars, or whatever the flick was called. Yeah. But while they were all together, they were making some real magic. Here oh, in my Friday gosh, that show. So that's one of those shows where as soon as I finish it, I think about when I can reasonably watch it again. Yes. Uh, so I found this really great kind of analysis uh, from The Atlantic in 2016, uh, which was the 10 year anniversary. Oh, my no, God. That can't be right, is it? Maybe. Hmm. Well, I just said it's it premiered 2008. It ran from 2006 to 2011. Oh, my dates are wrong. Well, that makes sense because 2008 to 2011. Would not be enough seasons. Would not be enough seasons. So let me talk a little bit about what the article says. Okay. And I think you'll appreciate it. It showed those people struggling and striving and doing what they had to to get by. In a television landscape that largely obscured notions of class and financial struggle, Friday Night Lights grappled explicitly with money and with the psychic strain that so often accompanies its absence. The Riggins brothers and their foraging of copper wire, spoilers to come. Spoilers. 
Jason Street teaming up with them to flip a house in a down market, the Taylors giving up their dream home, another turn of events foreshadowed in the series pilot once they realized how much stress the higher mortgage payments would add to their lives, Tyra and Julie working at Applebee's, Matt and Smash working at Alamo Freeze, Vince working at Ray's Barbecue. A crucial element of Friday Night Lights' expansive empathy was to recognize the ways that money can serve as its own kind of supporting character. Interesting. I've never really thought about the show a great like point, that. Though? Yeah. There, but, the show, well, the, the article talks about how there's a lot of cliches in the show. Sure. You know, like there's football players, there's cheerleaders, there's like nerds. And there's this idea of like, oh, this is like every other show. But there's something about it that feels very honest. And I think it's things like that that make the difference. It would not surprise me if there was a large part of our audience who's never watched this show before. So maybe like it would be worth explaining that it's a show about a high school football team in small town in Texas. Yes. Um, But it's a very, very good and like beloved football team that uh, the town has sort of built around. Um, and you hear that and you think fucking varsity blues and then go ahead and grab the steering wheel and jerk it clean in the other direction (laughs) because it's super not that at all. Um, and because a lot of people heard the title of the show and heard that it was about football and just assumed it wasn't for that. Oh, I don't care about football really at at all. The football's so good. But the football is very good. (laughs) This, this has maybe pound for pound the, uh, maybe other than Battlestar, like the best pilot episode yes. uh, of any TV oh, show. Gosh, what a big swing that it, pilot it, it takes. It is a big fucking swing. But yeah, what I like, like about what that article says, now that I think people who didn't know what the show is kind of yeah. know a bit more about it, is that it does like, it does, it is, it gets into like the, like the kind of bad behavior that you would expect from like a, a uh, very talented jock in a uh, small town football team where everybody in the town wants to like protect the, the football yeah. team at all costs. Like it gets into that. It certainly it doesn't shy away from that. There's so much other stuff that feels like a local study. Yes. Like it feels very, very yes. deeply Texas in a, in yes. a, in a way that is not like anything I've ever seen before because it's not like obvious in, in any way. Yeah. Um, it's got atmosphere like for days. Yeah. Well, and the other thing the article talks about is how each character like gets their time, you know, like there's no, there's no throwaway characters on this show. Like every character obviously serves a role, but you get to find out a little bit about why they are the way they are and why they're serving that role. And, and, uh, and it's just, it's just kind of incredible. It, it like, and I feel like if you watch that first episode, like if you get all the way through that first episode, like you're in, you're in, you yeah. know, it, it, it takes this very real thing for a lot of people. I mean, if you grow up in a small town, football kind of is, sure. that's what people do. You know, there isn't a lot to do on Friday night in a small town, except go to the football game and it kind of gives you that energy But then also kind of the very real stories behind it. And it's so good. Oh, God, it's so good. It's so good. Um, Yeah, I could talk all night about Friday Night Lights. There's a lot of like very powerful things. But I just think you should just watch it uh, because I don't want to. I was going to talk like, oh, what's your favorite moment? But like that's too. I can't do that. Um, Do you want to know my first thing? Yes. My first thing is and I had to be careful about how I worded it. Getting up high in a big city. Get, getting high up, maybe that's a better, getting high up in a big city, getting high, getting high up in a big city that I'm visiting. That's probably the best imaginable okay. way to put it. Okay. See, this is a good conversation for us to have. Yes. So pretty much any time we go, when we travel and go to a place where there is a big high up place um, where you can see a lot of the city, like a tall tower or something, I always want to go right up that bad boy and look down at the place that I am visiting. Um, and I feel like this has a pretty universal appeal, although I'm, I think maybe you are dissenting on this because you want to have a, an argument about it. I can tell from your <laughs> posture that you're like leaned in and ready to strike. Well, here's the thing. So I do appreciate that it gives you kind of your bearings to be able to see kind of the right. relative landmarks. But Getting- I will tell you, I get up there and I look around and I say, how long am I supposed to spend up here? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you, I think if you try to do it correct, I think if you try to do it right like that, like it's just gonna, it's you, you probably won't enjoy it. Because also, there's, I do like a lap, like, and I try and do a very leisurely lap around the space. Sure. Uh, and then what ends up happening is I think, okay. Yeah. 
I've definitely been up some towers in some places. I don't want to name cities because I don't want to like PO anybody who lives in these cities. But I've gone up a tower and looked around and seen the city from all around and thought like, okay, that's kind of cool. But I've definitely had experiences at the tops of towers where like you couldn't pull me off that fucking thing. You want trash on the arch? Is that what you're getting ready to do? The arch doesn't count. The Arch, I love St. Louis. I love you. You are a beautiful city. Uh, First of all, a lot of people might not even know that you can go up the Gateway Arch, which is the big arch in St. Louis. There is a a little elevator. Very little. Very fucking little. And they like slam like six people into these tiny cars where you are literally like making a little um, like not with your knees. Uh, and then you get up top and you are in a tiny crawl space with other people with these six inch high windows. You can like look straight down. on. It's really, really, uh, it was built a very, very long it time really ago. scared the shit out of me. But, uh, the first time I went up Willis tower, or Sears tower in Chicago, I'd been living there for like nine months of the one year that I lived there. Yeah. And it was incredible because That's I looked true. around and it was for the first time, like I felt like I was getting this context for this city that I was living in and really loved living in. Um, and it's not like I was up there doing some cartography. It was, it was just like a moment of really, uh, appreciating the, the size and the scope of, of the city that I was living in and seeing some like landmarks. I could actually, you know, kind of see Roscoe village. I could see my neighborhood from, from on top of the tower. And that mm-hmm. was really, really cool for me because holy shit, I've been living there for a long time and I, I've never really seen it like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really liked, I spent a lot, we spent a long time uh, on, in the uh, Tokyo Tower in, in Tokyo, which is like right in the middle of the city. There's also Tokyo Sky Tree, which is newer and bigger, but also really hard to get Where into. Where did we have a little coffee? Uh, that was in Tokyo Tower. I appreciated um, that. That was cool. They gave me something to do. Yeah, they have like a little <laughs> restaurant up there that we we had a little coffee and looked out at the city. And like, this was a city that we were having an incredible weekend and I'd always wanted to visit. And now like I had this sort of, sim city view of yeah. like this new perspective of and i thought i i don't know i think that's really cool i'm very into um the idea of when when traveling especially when traveling to like a big going overseas or doing some destination like that the idea of like doing something like this or going to like a um like a history museum for the place that you are visiting we did that both in in hong kong and we went to like a uh like a japanese art history museum in in Wayno park like yeah. that stuff of like uh, I, and I know that's like very touristy, right? There's a there's an, another school of thought that's just like, no, immerse yourself in the authentic culture. And like, yeah, that's good and important too. Um, but this is, uh, I don't know. I think this is a this is a pretty easy thing to do. And you're it's right, it, is, right. it is it is it is valuable and I, enriching yeah. in its own way. Yeah. No, and I do see that. I think traveling abroad, especially, I think that is it is a lot more valuable in that way. Um, stateside. I don't know. Didn't do a lot for me. <laughs> uh, no, I mean there is some. There, I, I've definitely been to. Yeah, I, it doesn't do as much. I feel like in order to, to, I just feel like all cities kind of start to look the same a little bit. You know, when you're like landing in an airplane and you look down and you're kind of like, this, this is what this most is fucking cities. John Bon Jovi over here. <laughs> what is this, Memphis? All right, let's rock. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I understand. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Although it does make the cities that are very like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to trash on any cities because I gen- I travel a fuck ton and yeah. play a lot of shows uh, across the country. I am I am very John Bon Jovi esque. Um, and I don't have like, I've always thought that about you. Thank you, baby. I don't have like bad city experiences, yeah. but I do have cities that like I fly into and you, you do kind of get that perspective as you are landing and you sort of break the, the cloud cover. Um, recently it was Phoenix, like landing in Phoenix, like, Oh fuck. Like they're like in the mountain. That's like a mountain yeah. right there. That's wild. Like, I do appreciate a good mountain. Yeah. I mean, there are cities that it is Seattle. I feel the same way. We're going to Seattle here in a couple of weeks. And I love, I love going to Seattle, like kind of for this very reason, because it's like geographically really fucking interesting. Yeah. Uh, and it also has like a distinctive, a distinctive look. I think I just think that because I feel like I know a little bit more about that city than, than most, but um, that's because I went up the, the space needle. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I went up there and I watched, I think the black eyed peas play a show at the stage that is like kind of under it for some tv show maybe oprah i am tripping balls right now there's Whoa, no way anything you are I just stringing said is some things together um but it doesn't just have to be a tower right um in Hong Kong, there is Victoria Peak, which is this mountain sort of on the western edge of Hong Kong Island, which is sort of the southern 
a portion of Hong Kong. Uh, and that was really cool because it's kind of right on the edge of everything. It's not in the middle of the city. It's like right on the outskirts of it, but it's so high up that you can see everything. And when you are in such a, like an environment that you are so unfamiliar with, like that is a really, really cool experience of just sort of getting the, getting the the groundwork laid out for you. Um, Ferris wheel too, like, um, getting, getting a Ferris wheel viewpoint of either, you know, a city where it's a permanent fixture or of the carnival that you're attending, um, is, is neat giving you that viewpoint. Also Ferris wheels just like do a lot. I feel like for a city skyline, Oh. Yeah, you're really selling me on this, Griffin. I yeah, I, I I like I and I know it's very basic, like going up a going up this go up the space needle. I feel like sounds very like I'm endorsing sort of this touristy behavior, but I think there's some th- there's some I have uh I, having traveled as much as I have, I feel like there are certain like touristy things that are like there's a reason everybody does it and there's a reason everybody should do it is because it's a, it's a genuinely sort of cool and, um, uh, like valuable experience to have. Yeah. No, Hey, Hey, Hey listeners, get up high in your own town, get up high in your own town, go, go up a tall building. You've never been to before living in the, I lived in the West Virginia building, which is the tallest building in Huntington. And I lived way up there and that was fucking cool. (laughs) That that was a town I'd lived in for 22 years. Um, and, and I saw like new perspectives of it. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you guys deal you away? Whoa. Hey, can I steal you away? (laughs) All right, yeah. Yeah, that would have been better in our Disney episode. Yeah. <laughs> you want to just go back and edit that in? Yeah, so and, and then I'll take use... I'll take the one from that episode and put it in here. Okay, good, good, good. Awesome. Hey, our first sponsor this week is Blapron. Blapron is so very good and they're called Blue Apron. And I like them enough that I'll go ahead and enunciate it a little bit more. But they deliver uh, fresh ingredients and step-by-step recipes right to your door. And they support a more sustainable food system. They give you the highest standards of ingredients. And they build a community of home chefs. They did that. They built us into the community. They enveloped us, much like the thing envelops uh, other sort of biological matter into its mass to transform and assimilate it. Blue Apron did that to to me uh, and made me into a chef kind. And uh, so they sent, we love Blue Apron. I really did learn a lot. I know I made it sound sort of body horror-esque, but um, they've done me a great service by teaching me a very valuable we skill. We never zested anything until Blue Apron. That's true. I never had zest. I didn't know what the zester was for. I thought it was for, you know, corns and bunions, but no. <laughs> it's so gnarly. It's so fucking gnarly. <laughs> so uh, anyway, here's how it works. You choose chef-designed recipes. They deliver fresh, seasonally inspired ingredients, and then you cook delicious meals in as little as 20 minutes. Minutes. So you can check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free at blueapron.com slash rose. That's blueapron.com slash rose to get your first three meals free. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. R-O-S-E. Yeah. How other... R-O-W-S. No. Okay. A lot of folks weren't with us in our original iteration, and they might be like, why is an R-O-W-S working? Yeah, yeah. Have we ever talked about... My first thing this week is crew. Uh, it's good. It gives you crazy muscles. The Winklevoss twins from the social network movie, like they were completely jacked, completely jacked up. And it was from rowing as hard as they were. <laughs> um, our second thing is, uh, second thing by which I mean other sponsor is, uh, MeUndies. Oh my gosh. I'm wearing them right now. It's a relatively new pair. First of all, they did send us, or I should say me. Are you checking to see? I am too. Hey, uh, I just got in the mail some Star Wars undies. Oh my gosh, Griffin was so excited. I was very excited. I still am excited. They have glow-in-the-dark elements, which I have not, uh, you know, exposed them to the light, so I don't really know um, exactly what's going to glow. You gotta charge them up. Got to charge them up first. <laughs> um, but I, I, I wear these exclusively now, and they feel so good. I feel like this is. I get so many tweets from people like, "Okay, yeah, like, yeah, I got them," and yeah, like, holy shit, they're very. They're they're like they're not like any other underwear I ever had worn before. It's a really nice thing you can do for yourself or do for somebody you care about. Get them get them just a nice 
nice little pair of underwear. Yeah, or you could get them a membership. They offer memberships now. You can uh, level up your top drawer with new undies each month. Members gain access to exclusive prints and special member pricing on every product MeUndies makes. And you can switch styles or skip any month that you want. So uh, to get your uh, 15% off your first pair, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash wonderful. That's MeUndies.com slash wonderful. This message is for Scott. It is from Dave. Scott, hello. It is me, your very own friend, Davis Deacon Brawler Baron. I'm here to say you're cool. Thanks for being a cool, good friend. That's a nice quality to have as a human. Uh, Good luck with this next part. Well, did you read the note at the top? So Max Fun staff work together to decipher this next. Okay. So let me give you the letters and then I'll, I'll give you the... The codex I received. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the letters are I L U I R I L. Sorry. <laughs> the letters are I L U I R L B B Y. Now they now Which, Max, maximum fun did give us this this breakdown of yes, the three acronyms. Yes. They, they did then say read it how you interpret it. Like they couldn't also yeah. figure out. So we we think it's I love you in real life, baby. Or bye bye yay okay <laughs> uh, P S friendship P P S Rachel and Griffin you're great P P <laughs> God what won't they say <laughs> uh is, is B B Y baby I think it's B B. I don't know anything. I'm going to get that wrong, baby. You've instilled the seed of doubt in my heart. Better be you. Better be you. I love you in real life. Better be you. <laughs> okay. Uh, this next message is for Angela. It is from Sarah. <laughs> hey, BB. See, I'm telling you. <laughs> you are the most wonderful friend. Your honesty and passion for love is everything. Thanks for being my pal since day one when you agreed to go shopping with me after I awkwardly complimented your skirt. But then we went to karaoke instead. Soulmate, sending you all the extra magic today from the voices of these good, good McElroys. That is a wonderful day y'all had. That is a, that's, that's a day worth making like a coming of age movie about, I feel like. We were going to go shopping, but we did karaoke instead. I feel like the first time that you go shopping with a friend always does feel a little awkward. I know. Because you're learning a lot about a person in that moment. Yeah, like what kind of junk they like to buy, um, how they walk between the stores. When I went when I went shopping once with this girl I was friends with in college, mm-hmm. but not very good friends, I always thought she was real cool. And then I felt like, oh, I have to buy something that she thinks is cool, too. Oh, has he bought a gun? No, I bought a pair of purple pants. One of those is even worse than the other one. <laughs> That's not true. I own purple pants and zero guns. Okay. Hi, I'm Biz. And I'm Teresa. And we host One Bad Mother, a comedy podcast about parenting. Whether you are a parent or just know kids exist in the world, join us each week as we honestly share what it's like to be a parent. I'm just going to end with this. Everybody, you're doing a remarkable job of swimming through the shit show that is parenting. So join us each week as we judge less, laugh more, and remind you that you are doing a great job. Find us on MaximumFun.org, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You want to hear my second thing? More than anything in my whole life. So I don't know what, what had me on a teen kick, uh, but my second thing, Friday Night Lights yeah, is yeah, a yeah. show about teens, uh, are teen poetry festivals. Yes. I'm so glad that you're doing this one because you sent me some, you sent me one video and as is my custom, mm-hmm. uh, the, YouTube's like Pringles for me, baby. <laughs> I can't, once I pop one, I have to, I watched like 14 teen, teen poetry uh, very, contest entries. very deliberately sent you a link because we've talked a little bit about slam poetry. Sure. And there's a lot of misconceptions out there about it. Uh, yeah. there's a lot of, like any piece of art, there's a lot of bad slam poetry. Can you talk a bit about your sort of background with this like specific yeah, so circuit? This is, this is interesting. So when I finished college, I was an English major and I did an emphasis in creative writing and I moved to Chicago, which has a big 
like a culture of of performance and and essayists and and writers and poets and MCs and there's just a very vibrant literary like artistic scene there. Is and, that where louder than a bomb? Yes. Like okay. Yes. So I started working at Barnes and Noble in the cafe and then was trying to find gigs that kind of filled my interest. And I just happened to get two things at the same time. I got an internship at the Poetry Center of Chicago. And chicken pox. Oh, uh, man. The story isn't at all connected. <laughs> <laughs> How weird that I brought it up. Uh, which was one day a week. Uh, and it was run by the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And it was like a a more kind of refined, like, uh, traditional poetry environment. Uh, and then I became the volunteer coordinator for Louder Than a Bomb, which was at that point, gosh, it was 2005. So I think it was in its fourth year. Um, was this before the documentary? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Several years before. Yeah. They made a documentary about Louder Than a Bomb. That, Actually that got, called Louder Than a Bomb. Yeah, they got some. It was, some it was Oprah. Plane. It was Oprah Network. Oh, was it? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I know a lot of people in that film because it was only maybe a year after I had left because okay. I, I did it in 2005. So they get hundreds of volunteers to like take tickets and um, be judges in poetry slams and, you know, handle like meals and greet people and all that stuff. And so I coordinated volunteers for that festival. And then I came back a second year and did it again uh, because it was just incredibly inspiring. Um, and so I did a little research just kind of on the whole concept of teen poetry festivals because I I, I wanted to like let people know that there's this whole movement out there of uh, kids doing a lot of performance poetry in this like really kind of incredible like almost speech and debate kind of style. If speech and debate was cool, and <laughs> yeah. sorry, speech and debate folks, <laughs> I don't know how well the comparison holds up because this this was I I went to a lot of speech and debate stuff, uh, and this would this this moved me in a way that speech and debate was yes incapable of ever doing. So, Ladder than a bomb that I referenced uh, came out of two thousand and one. Uh, there was a time in Chicago after uh, September 11th where they uh, were discouraging young people of color in particular from assembling in groups of more than two. And so there, there was this kind of what they called like an anti-gang movement. Uh, and so kids were discouraged from congregating together as groups. And Louder Than a Bomb kind of came out of that, of getting groups of kids together to give them kind of voice against authority and, and to speak to their own experience. And so they worked with the Chicago Public Schools uh, and several kind of independent teams to kind of build up this poetry festival. So the poets are 12 to 19 years old in middle or high school uh, or a community organization, and they compete as teams. Yes. And uh, so there are what they call bouts, where a member of each team will perform an individual piece, and then they'll perform a group piece. And they are scored, um, and then teams advance to, you know, semifinals, quarterfinals, that kind of thing. Um, what I loved about it is they make a big point about how this is like not about winning. You know, this is about sharing your story. Everybody has a story. So the kids in the suburbs that live in Oak Park, Illinois, and, you know, the kids that live, you know, in like less privileged parts of Chicago all have rights to tell their story right. and all have unique experiences worth sharing. And so they used to do this like call and response thing where the the leaders of them. So Anna West and Kevin Koval were the founders who I got to work with when I was there. And they used to say, the point is not the point. The point is the poetry. <laughs> And all these kids would chant it so enthusiastically. <laughs> it like warmed my heart so much to just see these people. Um, just like, and these kids like cheer for each other and be so moved by each other's stories and like feel so like heard and excited. Uh, and so I did some research on Brave New Voices, which is the international kind of culmination. So the kids that won in Chicago would get to go to Brave New Voices. 
Uh, and there are kids from like all over the world. Yes, who exactly. Can be to this. Every year, over 500 young poets uh, go to a different U.S. city for four to five days, and they get arts education, and then they get to like these workshops, and and then they get to perform. Uh, and so, I what I sent Griffin was the 2018 champions, uh, Baltimore was the team that won. They, they were called Do, D-E-W, Do More Poetry. I did what, end up watching virtually every team that could <laughs> yeah. be I really, really went to, it is the most poetry I think I've ever consumed in, in one sitting. Yeah, it's, um. so I read a little bit about Brave, so Brave New Voices started in 1996. Oh, wow, okay. So they just had their, their 20 year anniversary not long ago. Um, but if you read a little bit about Brave New Voices, they say, we firmly believe that young people must think of their voices as vital tools through which they can process their lives, shape the world around them, and hone their abilities to envision and create long-lasting impact. To achieve this, our programs employ best practices of arts education and youth development while encouraging young people to write about issues relevant to them in their own vernacular. We ask young people to engage in their own cultures to help bridge their personal literacies and the traditional academic literacies presented in school. Fuck yeah. It's just, it's incredible to watch these students get up and, and, you know, I mean, they're teenagers, right? So a lot of it is, you know, very dramatic and it's very emotional. And, and there's a, a tendency, I think, as an adult to start to listen to this and think like, oh, yeah, I know this kid, you know, like there, there's something about that experience of being a teenager that everybody thinks they understand. But what is, I think, incredible about these performances is these, these poets have, you know, have had the opportunity to really work with mentors and professionals and really get at exactly what it is about them that makes them so unique and makes their experience like so worth sharing, you know, it's and really, it's, it's, it's inspiring really to watch. It's really fucking remarkable. Go, go watch some of the, these, the, the Brave and New the group Voices videos. Pieces. The group pieces are the best. You sent me one that was all about how cartoon cartoons, like, yeah, like that's the Baltimore team dropping a lot of names of like cartoons was more of a, I, I got it. It's hard to really put this into words. Was more of a positive uh, role model, guiding force in in the lives of young queer people than a, a lot of adults who were supposed to be taking care of them were. And it it it, it drops. It talks about this obviously very very serious subject and does it through the lens of these these things that were important to me when I was a kid weren't just like, yeah. they weren't just stupid cartoons. They were standing in for something that like you were supposed to be giving me. Yeah, like didn't. making me feel accepted. Oh my God, and, and, it yeah, fucked So if me you're up. looking for this, so the YouTube channel is Youth Speaks uh, and the piece we're speaking of is Brave New Voices Finals 2018 Baltimore Round 2. Uh, it's fucking incredible. I'll, I'll tell you, like, I think what what moved me so much was obviously like you said, like seeing this like um, very, ta very talented and brilliant group of like young, super diverse poets get, get out there and tell their stories in such a like crystal clear, like uh, very like super, super relatable way was like very moving. But there's also, I think an impulse that like I am kind of aging into of, um, and, and it's something I feel kind of guilty about. And I think that's normal too, of like, oh, wow, we're going to be okay because the, 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 the people younger than me, the next generation are going to like save the world. Yeah, uh -huh. And it's a, and watching these videos, you, you get that like, yeah. oh my God, if, if this is, if this is the next generation, that's great. And that is, I, I feel guilty about that because it's like they sh they shouldn't have to. A lot of their poetry is about how they were they were wronged by generations that came before them, and so for us to like look at their their beautiful stories and think like ah, we're going to be okay is a very very like privileged way to look at it. Well, it just tells it shares with you the value of empowering young people. You know, yeah. I think so much, and that's and that's what and the they, brave seem, new... they are powerful as fuck yeah. in these videos. The, the the Brave New Voices kind of mission is to kind of bridge that understanding of like scholarly, like I go to school and I get talked to and I learn about other people's stories. And here's how I have my own story and yeah. how I tell it. And, you know, with the influence and support of what I'm learning in school. Uh, 
And when you give young people an opportunity to do that and motivate them and make them feel valuable, like there's so much strength there. It's so inspiring. I watch those group performances where what will usually happen is they'll, you know, they'll, they'll have portions of it where they're speaking in unison, where they have shared, Mm -hmm. you know, lines, and then they will break off and kind of individually tell their own piece and their own story and then come back together and speak in kind of one voice. And I just get chills nonstop, just over and over again chills, because they'll say something incredibly powerful, and then they'll all join together and say something as a group. And it's just like, oh my gosh, when I when I got to witness this in person, like, I would really recommend you checking out videos because um, there's one thing to like read a poem and there's another thing to see a group of people perform it together with just all of their heart, you know, and energy and, and like choreography, choreography yeah, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it's fucking great. Um, my second thing, I feel like this is going to be pretty fast. It's a song. Um, I realized I've never talked about iron and wine before, which is weird because that they, he, I guess may be like pound for pound. My like, yeah, that's crazy to me that you have favorite. Um, I've talked about some of my favorites, but when I think about like the music that has meant, uh, a lot to me for, for a long time, it, it's iron and wine. Uh, I wanted to talk specifically about, um, I thought about bringing like some, some albums of his, but, uh, I think it would be better to just drill down into one song. It's, uh, the trapeze swinger. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's is it's a very very beautiful song that I think kind of kind of encapsulates some of my favorite stuff. So Iron and Wine is a, a American singer songwriter. Uh, his name is Sam Beam, but he uh, performs under the name Iron and Wine, which I think he got from some sort of like old timey supplement that was like get your get your oh. your bone in Iron and Wine. Uh, I forget the the exact story about it. Um, and he just plays these like really. Um, uh, like occasionally like remarkably gentle and and lovely folk songs although i think as his career progressed he sort of experimented with other um funkier genres um and that stuff is good too but sort of uh for for me the golden age was uh his 2004 album which is called our endless numbered days which if you watched any movie or watched any tv show from the years uh, 2004 to 2006 you defo heard uh, some music from this. He had, he had music. Um, I don't know, man, probably like Grey's Anatomy. I'm just spitballing here, but I'm betting that there were multiple songs on there. He had a song on the garden state soundtrack, um, which is how I was first exposed to, to his music. Um, the trapeze swinger is actually, it was written for a movie. It wasn't on an album before it was first uh, released on an album on, uh, around the well, which is like this rarities and b-sides compilation album that is fucking phenomenal uh it was written for the movie in good company remember that one no <laughs> yeah that was topher grace and dennis quaid and scar joe and topher grace is i guess working for Den. i saw this movie i definitely saw oh my it gosh. I, was, I think I, it was one of those i think i rented it at blockbuster if that sort of places it mm-hmm. in time for you but like dennis dennis quaid was like Tover Grace's boss, but Tover Grace was dating Scar Jo, who yeah, was yeah. Okay, this sounds familiar. Uh, Dennis Quaid's daughter, um, and I don't remember the movie being good, but this song is a fucking like folk <laughs> masterpiece, and it was written for it. It's a weird. It's a. It's it's definitely the best thing to come out of this film. So I, would, I should go watch this movie. No, I wouldn't say to do that, but okay. I will say that the Trappy Swinger is my. Fa- is first of all titled our endless numbered days so like any track off that is going to be like i love you i love you i love you we're ashes and bones in the ground and it's like ah shit you couldn't stop before the third thing um the trapeze swinger is 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 no different this is a song if god okay it's it's it is a message right it's like a, a letter or a missive of some sort from somebody who has passed away to uh, a former love of theirs who is still alive. That is sort of brass tacks, like what this song is about. But it, it tries to, in in eight verses, no choruses, just eight verses back to back to back, tries to uh, capture sort of the entire life experience uh, through, the, through the lens of this relationship. Every verse uh, starts out with, please remember me, and then some sort of direction in which that this person wants to be uh, remembered. Uh, and it, it reflects on this, this person, this couple's life and their experiences. It also includes um, this really, 
really beautiful sort of interpretation of the afterlife, specifically standing at the pearly gates and seeing messages that people have written on the pearly gates to the people who are still alive, who are going to get there after them so that they can like find each other. Like, Oh shit. Like, yeah. all right, Sam, this is, this is my favorite verse. Um, it goes, please remember me fondly. I heard from someone you're still pretty. And then they went on to say that the pearly gates had some eloquent graffiti, like we'll meet again and fuck the man and tell my mother not to worry. And angels with their gray handshakes were always done in such a hurry. Like, Mm. It's it's it. I, I feel like there is a type of song that is so melodramatic that is like so like oh god you're writing a song about like I feel this way about um and that I'm not better than the, I'm not above this song but do you know uh, I will follow you into the dark by Death Cab for Cutie yes. uh, that it, it, that's like a song that's like it, when you when you die i'll die there right with you buddy and it's like whoa <laughs> shit death and I, I think this is like touching that rail a little bit yeah. for sure um but it does so so beautifully like the 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 imagery of this song is so so gorgeous um it's it's unbelievably sad uh like a lot of iron and wine's music is sad but it's like that good kind of sad that makes you feel like contemplative oh and romantic which no surprise like this came out in 2004 i graduated college or uh, high school in 2005 so i was like strapped in ready for the fucking ride uh that this album and all of iron and wine's music would like take me i rode this wave for the next four <laughs> fucking years and it sort of defined this like period of like melancholy but this like very uh indulgent melancholy yes. that's not all bad because it, you're sort of taking a, a big look at the bigger picture of Gosh, things indulgent melancholy could be one of our wonderful things i know <laughs> yeah i i i think that there's a definitely an unhealthy way to take that but i think that there's also oh, a, har man. a harmless and like fun way Can to I take tell that you, it's one of the things that i miss most about my 20s is yeah. indulgent melancholy <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> and this is this is for sure a soundtrack to that but i i also think that it uh transcends it and yeah. i also think it is like one of the most beautiful songs ever written both sort of like l lyrically and narratively but also like it checks like all the iron and wine boxes of shit i love like very simple chord progression really beautiful harmonies, really like a rhythmic acoustic guitar, like all of that stuff that was all over Endless Numbered Days and uh, Creek Drank the Cradle and uh, Around the Well and all those albums. It's like, uh, that's like my favorite stuff that Iron and Wine mm -hmm. does. And this song has it all in this nine and a half minute. It's a fucking super long song that weirdly, like miraculously when it's over you, when somebody does Highway to Hell at karaoke, I get furious. <laughs> Because it's like, okay, the rest of us want to sing too. Like, I felt all 15 minutes of that fucking meatloaf song. Oh, do you mean Bad Out of Hell? Bad Out of Hell. Yes. Yeah. So sorry. Okay. Um, but this song, nine and a half minutes goes by, and I feel like I. I, I what if somebody did that song at sure. karaoke? <laughs> it would be, okay. That would actually be terrible. <laughs> That would be really, really bad. Uh, yeah, because I don't want to get that sad when I'm... People who do sad songs at karaoke, I don't know sometimes. Is there a good sad karaoke song that's like, Ooh. oh, this is a good one. This is a good prompt. <laughs> Man, it's tough to say. There's good sad songs. I was thinking like Yesterday by the Beatles, but like oh. I don't, that's not a good karaoke is song. Is What's Up a sad song? No, it's a powerful song. <laughs> Fast Car. Have you ever seen someone do that at karaoke? I think I've seen Justin do that at karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Trappy Swinger is great. Uh, it's off Around the Well, which, uh, I, well, it's off uh, in good company, uh, but it's also on Around the Well if you want to go listen to it. That whole album, man, that used to be, I would put that whole, I had that whole album on my Zune. It was like two discs, and the first disc was like his really lo-fi yeah. like uh the sea and rhythm like era shit that was i still that's still my favorite and we have that on vinyl now actually we do yeah and it's two discs once one side of one uh <laughs> record is the trapeze swing yeah, it takes right. up an entire side <laughs> uh it's it's fucking it's it, it, it's it's a beautiful song it's one of my favorite songs uh, do you want to know what some of our listeners' favorite stuff is? Yes. Uh, Aaron says, I just love seeing little kids with their big backpacks. They're ready to take on the world, and their Paw Patrol backpacks are going to hold it for them. 
That is the cutest. I, You know what I thought about the other day? Because people talk about how Henry's going to be older before we know it. Yes. I pictured him walking into elementary school with a big backpack. I need I, to listen to Iron Wine right now. <laughs> I almost lost my mind. <laughs> oh, my God. How could you do that to me? I'm sorry. Just the image of him. You knocked the wind out of me. I know. Jessica. <laughs> He's not even two yet, so we have some time. Not any time at all. Our days are numbered and endless and beautiful <laughs> and poignant. Jessica says, my partner roasts coffee, so even on days that our schedules don't allow us to see each other, he is always a part of my morning. Isn't that nice? That's so nice. Because it gets in the, to the hot bean territory, and I love that. But like, what if what if I made you special hot beans, and then when I traveled, and you made the hot beans in the morning to make the coffee? That would be perfect. It, it would be like a, my stink was all around. And I get to stop sleeping in your dirty clothes. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Hayden, this is an emotionally challenging user submission, <laughs> listener submission segment. I like how I said user. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome user to the wonderful experience. Please enter disc A to continue. What if podcasts came out in the early 80s and were delivered on floppy disks? <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's my new fucking aesthetic. That's like my that's like my new vaporwave. I'm surprised podcast. hipsters haven't started doing that. Of the, like, here's here's my next episode on floppy disk. Could you even? We would have to compress it a lot because I don't know how big. I think you can get like sixty four oh, megabytes. Well, people on. would have to get floppy disk players. <laughs> they probably do. Man, I loved a good floppy disk. Not the big ones, like the 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 tinier ones. Oh yeah, the okay. like hard plastic ones. Yeah yeah. yeah. They were floppy, though. Hayden says, I work closing shifts at Starbucks, and after work, I go for a long walk at a nearby park. There are so many rabbits at this park late at night, and rabbits are my absolute favorite animal. I didn't know this happened, that the rabbits come The rabbits come out at night. I didn't know that that happened. Oh, what song were you just singing then? You know, the freaks come out at night. The no. freaks come out at night. No. The freaks come out at night. I like that. That reminds me, though, and I don't want to detract from the rabbits, but I saw 11 deer tonight. Holy shit, what? We have a lot of deer in our area, and they had all congregated in somebody's yard. They were having a little deer meeting. I tell you, when I take the trash out to the garbage cans, I see a frog every time. <laughs> this is great. This is great podcast. <laughs> And it could be great, too, because it's like, if you want to hear the rest of the frog story, insert disc 17. <laughs> and then it's up to you. Like, if you do not want to hear the frog story, I totally get it. Pop right in 18 and we'll we'll keep we'll tell you about the closer. <laughs> We're going to read all about um, sort of the Max Fun Network and thank Bowen and Augustus and all that. Oh, you don't want to do that disc either. OK, we'll see you next week. <laughs> Expect the next package in the mail. So I do want to thank Bowen and Augustus for the use of our theme song, Money Won't Pay. Oh, it's such a good song. It's a really good song. You can find a link to that in the episode description. Uh, I want to thank Max Fun for having us on the network. You can go to MaximumFun.org. Check out all the great shows there. Shows like One Bad Mother. Uh, shows like Inside Pop. Shows like Bubble or Bubble. Judge John Hodgman. Yes, and so many more at uh, MaximumFun.org. You can check out the other stuff we do at McElroyShows.com. What else, baby? Please review our show positively on your podcast app. Yeah, every time you do that, we get $100. And the other <laughs> no. podcasts won't tell you that, but every time you do that, we get $100 from... Um, from uh, from Apple. Uh, so that's going to do it for us this week. We'll be back next time with a a whole lot of um, just scandalous sort of scoop. Some celebrity goss. I think the next one we're going to talk about what is new with Pierce Brosnan. Alf. Dennis Quaid, Topher Grace. Topher Grace. What was that name that you said that I didn't recognize? Spiven? <laughs> surely there's something in there that's going to be a good final thing to say i think so unless you want me to talk about the juice boxes that are in your trash can oh, goodbye everybody <laughs> i will not i know <laughs>